Welcome to episode number 195 of the Canadian Prepper Podcast. We are recording on February the 12th, 2023. My name is Eric, host of the show, Beast in Southern Ontario, uh, target shooter, ham radio operator, computer geek, and uh, started a small preparedness company to help people uh, better prepare for at least 72 hours, if not longer. I'm Alan. I'm a safety trainer, first responder, security expert, overall safety nerd, and definitely not Ian. Are you sure? You'll never know. <laughs> I'm Scott, a first responder from Ontario. I like learning things and I worry about our fragile infrastructure. And I'm Jeff. I am based in central Ontario. I'm a target shooter, ham radio operator, general overall handyman, and weather nerd. My name is Jer. I'm a tactical beard owner, based t-shirt guru, and a government critique. And uh, what what happened to the beard there, bud? Yeah, are you sure you're still a tactical Don't beard owner? Yeah, really. All I'm going to say is I did not partake <laughs> willingly in this scenario, but yes, uh, it got it got trimmed a little while ago, and uh, apparently, uh, just like you know, it was kind of square and like whatever, you know, just. Rounded off meant that uh, about three and a half inches got cut off. So when it was all done, I went to the bathroom. I was like, I don't fucking like this. And I, like <laughs> someone came to our house, right? I was like, well, this went horribly fucking wrong. And I'm just, I'm like, I'm, I'm not going to kill someone in my house. So we just left it at that. But apparently it's going to grow better now. So mm. we've got, uh, we've got about two months for that to happen. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> and if you want to help support the show and keep the Canadian Prepper Podcast on the air, you can buy some swag. We have both the Canadian Prepper Podcast t-shirt, tonight being shown off by Jeff, and the Tactical Velcro patch, tonight being shown off by Scott, both available at www.prepperpodcast.ca. All proceeds help keep the lights on and be back of generator fueled. And if you're enjoying the show and you like Pierre's beard, please take a few minutes and like us on Facebook and submit a review on iTunes. We also want your feedback, good, bad, or what you think of his beard, or if there's a topic you want us to cover, you can email us at feedback at prepperpodcast.ca. All right, we've got some transmittable content for you in this episode. We're going to start off with some recent news articles. I will update you on our personal preps, and then we're going to get into the main topic. We're talking about uh, NVIS and nerding out on ham radio tonight. So let's move into let's the see. news. I had a bunch of ideas of things we could talk about, but then everybody else already put them in. So something, something, UFOs, Russia, China, Ukraine, we're all doomed. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the news has kind of been completely bombarded by the whole UFO thing going on. Uh, we did solve that earlier today in our little uh, Prepper Podcast uh, chat group. <laughs> we have found out that it was actually Scott who was, um, you know, testing out some of his most recent um, uh, plans and such, and um, for his gasifiers. I'm sorry. <laughs> You know, the hydrogen and, mix was just a little rich in the gasifier, that's all. Yeah, when the gasifier decided to take off, it turned into a UFO that was then shot down by NATO. Yeah. Scott, Scott, by the way, has just changed his last name to Hindenburg. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These things happen. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough, I suppose. So I've got a couple um, non-UFO um, ones. So I'm sure everybody's already heard by now, or at least you should have, the uh, massive earthquake that hit Turkey and Syria. Um, I mean, there's over 33,000 dead. A bit on the bright side, uh, it's six and a half days since the uh, earthquake happened, and they're still pulling live people out of the rubble. Wow. So I just kind of nice. wanted to, to make a mention of that to say to people that, you know, if your power's out for six hours, the world's not ending. You don't need to panic. You don't need to call 911. You don't need to, you know, get first responders out there because your power is not on. These people have survived for six days, mm. um, probably half crushed in rubble with no food, no water. You can survive for a day or two without hydro. So, uh, I mean, as always, be prepared. You can't prepare for an earthquake. If it's going to happen and your building is going to fall on you, good luck. But, um, but power outages you certainly can be ready for. Yeah. Yes. And the other one I wanted to touch on, and it, 
and I'm going to come maybe put my tinfoil hat on a little bit. Wait but, a minute. Wait a minute. Um, on a prepper podcast? Tinfoil hat? Yeah, I know. I know. You should I come know, with it on already. Come on now. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a very large uh, train derailment in Palestine, Ohio, uh, involving a whole bunch of uh, hazardous and dangerous chemicals. Um, there's not been a lot of information that's come out of it. Um, I mean, there was a lot of bad chemicals, vinyl chloride being one of them that was involved in this, but it, people are saying it's kind of the epicenter it would be of a, a chemical warfare bomb. It was that bad. Um, and it's just not getting the media attention. It's not getting, you know, their reports are popping out now of fish dying miles downstream and they're finding all kinds of farm animals in the area that are that have died and whatever. So apparently the EPA or whoever the, the environmental people are is saying it's fine for people to go home. And there's a lot of people that, that aren't going home. Um, the other reason I wanted to bring that up was just to kind of go back probably a year or so ago. Um, one of our other panelists, Hughes, um, had a bit of a, a fire wildfire, I guess, or brush fire near his house, and they had 10 minutes to get out. Well, this was kind of the same thing. This train derails, you got to knock on your door, you got five minutes to get out. So, you know, again, I know we've never said it before that you should be prepared and you should test your stuff and you should be ready to go when something happens. So yeah, I just want to be the first time we've said that. that. Yeah, 195 episodes, yeah. that's the first time we've ever mentioned that, I think. Yep. Yep. Test I your stuff, you know, use it. <laughs> There should be a podcast about that, like getting there ready should, for stuff yeah. to happen. Yeah, or you think that within a, 195 episodes, we may have mentioned, you know, get your get your stuff together and know how to use it. But it took us a while to get there, I guess. Yeah. Listen, we had we had to build up to something here. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> Thanks for the support up until now, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> we finally made it. <laughs> and now that we have your attention, I'd like yeah. to talk to you about Amway. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to read you about your insurance expired or extended insurance policy. Ex no, your extended <laughs> warranty through yeah, your car. And warranty, yeah. warranty, not insurance, yes. Oh, warranty. Boy. <laughs> All right, shall we move into what we've done lately for preps? Absolutely. So uh, I've been away for a couple of weeks, so it gives me lots to, to do. So I'm going to take the Ian roll here. Uh, Cracked out the ham radio, played with some equipment, and did some uh, NVIS testing uh, mm -hmm. with Eric's help. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, it's uh, quite a lot of fun. I very much enjoyed doing it. Uh, again, sort of test your equipment. You know, it's great that it's here, but if, if I haven't figured out how to set it up, how to use it efficiently, how to use it in a crisis, well, mm -hmm. then it's probably not as, as valuable. Um, I, uh, for, our test your gear idea. I decided to keep my wood stove going for about two weeks solid. Um, so I was firing logs in every couple hours, keeping it cranked during the day. Uh, and then at night uh, I would pack it in just as tight as I could set it on low. And in the morning it was usually still a hot amber bed and I could just put more wood in and it would uh, eventually light itself. So I thought that was kind of cool. Hmm. Uh, played around with a vacuum sealer with uh, one of my good mag buddies. I'm just looking at a way of securing long-term items so that they're just perfectly airtight, waterproof, um, you know, and you can sort of pack them away. And if they're in camping gear or whatever, they're not going to, um, you know, at least you don't have to worry about the water aspect or uh, air exposure or whatever. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. Uh, and then I was uh, out having dinner and ended up, sort of sitting next to someone I didn't know and somehow freeze dried food came up and <laughs> we just ended up having a great conversation about all the kinds of things that, that we think about just in terms of uh, shaking off that continuity bias about uh, there's always going to be food at the grocery store and power from the wall and so on and so forth. So um, anyway, out of your really tap. Yep. Yep. quite, mm -hmm. quite enjoyed that. So, so it's been a productive couple of weeks. Yeah, those random conversations right. are always fun. You Absolutely. never really know where they're going to go. <laughs> and sometimes it's the, the person who, would, who you would think would be the absolute last one that would mm -hmm. be a prepper turns out to be uh, yep. as hardcore as ever. So true. for context there, um, 
up until you know when when my wife and I were were kind of first dating, she thought it was ridiculous that I owned guns and thought it was completely unnecessary. And then last week, she asked if I could teach her how to shoot them. So that's that's where we've gone in this world. <laughs> Mm-hmm. People nice. do come around. <laughs> Sometimes it takes time, but no. I didn't do a lot for preps this week. I just did a bit of a uh, food prep. I'm still doing a bit of toying around with my canner. I'm uh, hopefully if there's enough people that uh, a lady that I know is going to hold a canning class this week for a couple hours. So I'm going to nice. pop over there and get my feet wet and start to, uh, start working on the canning and Probably shouldn't I shouldn't put your feet in the work. canner, Jeff. Oh man. <laughs> Why not? Come on. <laughs> Sorry. I had to feet get pickled. Know, not <laughs> and I did some fuel rotation. That's about it. All right. Uh, so for myself, uh, like Scott said, did the NVIS testing with him the one day. Uh, it was fun to get kind of things set up. We were always trying to see if we could make contact on the radio between uh, our two locations. So that was, uh, it was a fun little test to, to get sorted out. And then uh, on February the 5th, the, uh, the London uh, Ham Radio Club was actually sponsoring an NVIS test. Um, so they had a net controller who was calling for contacts and just logging whoever they could uh, on NVIS. They're asking for certain parameters, like what uh, type of rig you're operating, uh, what type of power, what type of antenna. Uh, and then, of course, call sign uh, just for requirements of identification. And, um, yeah, we'll get into a little bit more on that a little bit further into the episode here. But uh, that was a lot of fun to to test out and play around with. Um, like Jeff, I've been uh, a little lax. Um, I'm kind of up to my eyeballs in school, work, um, <laughs> training, all kinds of great things. Uh, I did finish one of my two uh, professional designations that I'm trying for this year. So I now have another set of letters after my name, which is good that it's done for a few years, I guess. <laughs> um, other than that, it's, uh, it's been not a lot. I did do some fuel rotation mostly because I forgot to go to the gas station. Um, but that's uh, that's why we have a reserve of, uh, of fuel. Mm-hmm. Oh, I did repair my shed that stores that fuel. Uh, we had a windstorm back before Christmas at did some damage, so I finally got around to fixing it yesterday because it was a beautiful day. Nice. Um, didn't do too too much practical, a little bit more running around, but uh, we got some supplies stocked up. Um, our daughter's gotten to that age where half the clothes doesn't fit, but the other clothes is too big. So we've had like a mishmash of a bunch of clothes that doesn't really fit her, so... Um, got a lot of clothes sorted out so organize her room get her a little more comfy so we can get some other stuff done um got to spend a whole day with mel um daughter was gone on the weekend so we got to just go around to a few stores uh found some really good prepping supplies and just stock up stuff that we were like hey that's a smoking deal let's pick it up for the preps as well as just uh nice to hang out and uh we got the the venue paid for the wedding this year, so that was a, a nice big thing that we were very ecstatic about. And then I got part one of two f- completed for uh, the gun club that I finally nice. got into. So I'm very ecstatic nice. about that. Yeah. It's always fun to hop through those hoops. Yeah, oh, so I, I, was, I was hoping to get to the one that's a little bit closer because... It's a little bit cheaper. It's still a nice facility, don't get me wrong, but like just the yearly cost is mm-hmm. lower. And I'm like, that one's only like 20 minutes. This one's 40 minutes. Um, the, this one I'm going to is about double the price, but <clears throat> it's still a decent price for an Ontario range, but like very nice facilities. It goes up to 200 yards. They've nice. got nine ranges on top of a bunch of other ranges, which nobody's allowed. Like he has specific ranges for law enforcement, military training and everything. So it's not like they're booking up, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. the ranges that you pay to hopefully use. Like he's yep. got a completely separate. So yeah, I know fantastic reviews and I know a few Good. people that have gone there or whatever, but yeah, I mean, I tried to get into the one close to us, but uh, there's a guy that lives in town. He's been trying for like, I think this is the first time he finally got in and he's been trying for six years. Oof. So I was like, all right, I'll, I'll dabble into the other one. And, yep. and it worked out, you know, a few people backed out and they were like, Hey, you know, this nice. is what it is. You got two days. So yeah, it, it worked out. So yeah, we're, we're ecstatic. Finally get the, some more trigger time without yep. having to, you know, make a whole bunch of other arrangements. Yep. So very nice. Yes, it does make it fun. 
I should mention we yeah. did try and fill the freezer a little bit. Uh, my wife was in uh, was over in the U.S. Uh, over the weekend. Um, couldn't bring chicken back over the border because of oh. the avian flu. Mm. So even though they were dead and frozen, uh, apparently that's still a thing. So yeah. that was you know, seventy bucks well wasted and worth of chicken. That sucks. Yeah, it does. But, but can you? <laughs> I see eat a lot of chicken. Yeah. <laughs> Just eating raw chicken at the border. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is not going away. So I'll deal with the two days. Of There's got to be a barbecue somewhere. <laughs> well, there was in the back of my truck. She just oh. not in the. Uh, um, she she was she was out with she was over there with her dad but, and uh, yeah didn't have it, which is weird because he's the one that usually has like the Weber grill strapped to the back of his like 1993 tracker, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not the, not this time apparently. So yeah, that was uh, I found that I found that out the hard way today. Um, the uh, the government the government does not want us bringing uh, chicken across the border. But so if if the chicken had it and it's been processed and frozen, like does it still have it after the unthaw process? Don't ask questions. Is that what it there. is? You have been told. <laughs> you have just... been told. Sir, no, 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 no. A little bit here. Chicken garbage can. No. Yep. Stop. No, no. It doesn't even go in the garbage can. It goes in a freezer. Which is what else would you think? It's absolute, okay. absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> so I guess the unthaw part kind of makes sense from that. Part. Yeah, but okay, I'm gonna thaw no, it no, and no. cook it. Like, <laughs> yeah, but oh, I, I still don't understand there's... how a respiratory virus can be transmitted through muscle, through, like through muscle tissue, um, but. I'm no epidemiologist, so who knows? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You can probably I, I heal one nowadays. I might need to, make a, I might need to you visit tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you might need to visit tomorrow. Well, you know, I, and, I, and I'm not saying it's nothing new, but I mean, and I, I can remember years ago, we I went with my parents. We took a trailer and went to Florida, and mom bought a bunch of oranges from Florida, and it mm-hmm. said right on it, like, imported from Florida, or product of Florida, whatever, put it in the trailer, we got to the border. They seized it. They're like, nope, mm-hmm. you cannot bring that across the border. We're like, it came from Florida to Canada. We're just taking it back. And they're like, nope, can't have it. They took it, threw it in the garbage. We were yeah, not and then you went to the grocery the store and picked Bought up the same oranges, oranges yep. imported from, from Florida. Yep. Yep. I'm seeing a trend here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Prepping for a barbecue okay. at the border. <laughs> <laughs> and, and screwdrivers. Yep. So we got a, a comment in the live chat here from Brittany just uh, talking about another balloon or whatever shot down near Tobermory today. Uh, makes me think about Bruce Power and uh, how close. So I uh, figure we'll talk about the whole balloon thing for a second here, get everybody's kind of thought on it before we move into NVIS, because I know everybody probably wants to chat about that because that's kind of a thing right now. My, my first question is how many times does this happen and it doesn't get reported? Yes, that, that's my that's my first question. Because is this just a slow news cycle and this is totally normal? Yeah, could be. Or what are they trying to divert us from? The Epstein list? I don't know. Uh, could be. Yeah, that that was my first thought. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Wait, correct me if I'm <laughs> wrong. They launch high altitude weather balloons all the time. All the like, damn time. Yes. So you know there are probably going to be. Any given day, dozens, if not hundreds, of balloons float around. That's how they measure what's going on with the jet stream, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the one supposed spy balloon has kind of you know, made all the other balloons in trouble and we're just shooting down weather balloons now. Um, I think it'll that's be interesting. Point. Well, uh, you know, if we're just getting a little... Uh, trigger happy at any balloon and <laughs> we're shooting yeah. down things that have little, always been there and aren't, problem, but aren't spy balloons. Balloon lives matter, guys. Let's be real. <laughs> this is gonna, it's going to come careful, full circle. Careful. Here we go. Careful going to yeah. a kid's birthday party if you're getting trigger happy around balloons. Mm-hmm. So it's just that the wasn't this uh, cartel is in on it. That's all. Wasn't this, wasn't this the plot of what was the Clint Eastwood movie? Clear and present danger. No, in the line of fire when he was the secret service agent and there was the plot to assassinate the president and they just kept popping balloons instead of and, and making it sound like gunshots. No, I think that's I it. Think, yeah. I think that was a movie. I think that was in the line of fire. I, yeah. As soon as I saw that, like, yeah. oh, we're popping, we're, balloons are dangerous now. I, 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 that's what I thought of. 
Yeah, no, I think it's definitely something to kind of keep your uh, keep your eye on and, and pay attention to. But um, I don't know if it's really worth freaking out about right now. Like a lot of people are kind of going one way yeah, or the other. I mean, and and uh, obviously, I mean, you- listening to the mainstream media isn't going to help you at all because mm-hmm. um, I mean our our Canadian. I don't even know Anita, and, and I can't remember what her position is, but she came out the first one that got shot down and kind of described it, said, oh, it was cylinder shaped, it was this, it was that, whatever. Next time she came out, we just got rid of it. I think she yep. got told, you don't, you don't, yeah, you don't, don't talk about, no, no you don't say anything about what it is. Yeah, just that it was shot down. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. and I can understand. And now the, the, now the new word is the one today that uh, Brittany mentioned over Tormori. They said it was, quote, decommissioned. That was mm. their, that was the government's official quote. We decommissioned we it. Decommissioned it. Hmm. Uh, that's friendly. I'm gonna, I'm gonna so use that next covered. time I get asked what what happened to the uh, to the pizza. I decommissioned it. Decommissioned the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> oh geez, no, but yeah, I know a lot of people are kind of going a little squirrely about it and getting all freaked out. I, uh, like I said, I think it's worthwhile paying attention to, but I don't think it's really something to yeah. be getting all squirrely about quite yet. I mean, yeah, it's something to keep an eye on, but I mean, you also yeah. got to think about if the only place you're going to find information on what was shot down is from Main Street Media. Yeah. You know, I've, I've got more questions than answers that they're going to give me. Yep. So, I mean, uh, it's something to keep on the back burner and potentially keep some useful tools easily handy um, around. But, um, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, is there just been, you know, did they just deploy new cameras that can, or radar that can see just a little bit better? And, you know, weather balloons being out, like, there, there's so many questions that I'm just like, I'm going to give it like a month or two. And then mm-hmm. hopefully we get something semi sort of reliable to um, the real information. Because yeah. uh, everything right now is, there's just too much that I'm like, I, I, I need more information. I need a, yeah. uh, Information from a reliable source, some sort of that. I think this is not with right CBC, now. Pierre. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think this well, is going to be like the clown fiasco of what was that, 2017 or 2018, where people are just like, it's something to focus on that's not the rest of our world for mm-hmm. a few minutes, and then it's just going to go away because it's actually something uh, totally normal. Yeah. Well, I was hoping we could beat them with a hammer, like the clowns back then. Well, I'm not saying you was can't trying to beat the balloons with a hammer. I'm also not saying they might not enjoy oh, it. I wasn't but... talking about the balloons. I was talking about who's telling me about the balloons. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> For legal purposes, that's a no, joke. Probably a terrible idea to beat anything mm-hmm. with a hammer except the nail. <laughs> or, or a screw if your drill is right. Oh, I, I guess if your drill is broken, yeah. But yeah. yeah, ultimately, if it's something that's concerning you, maybe yeah. step up your preps a touch, add a few extra cans to the shopping cart, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. But uh, I don't think it's really worth losing our minds over quite yet. But keeping an eye on it absolutely is. So yeah, absolutely. Make sure you keep up your can to can opener ratio. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Yes. How could I have forgotten about that advice? Yes. Make <laughs> sure that you can your can opener ratio. Your yes. skill detector are charged. Oh, geez. You yeah. had to go there, Jeff. I did. <laughs> All of a sudden, next yep. week, so before next week, you should buy stocks in 9-volt batteries and can openers. <laughs> yes. You might see a little bit of growth potential. You know, it'll be a quick, uh, <laughs> throw 100 bucks in, you get 150 bab out next week, you know, quick yep. turnaround cash. Reinvest it in more can openers. Yep. Good. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, I just wanted to kind of get that out because I know a lot of listeners are probably wondering on our, uh, our take on what's going on with that because it's kind of a the buzz thing going on right now. But with yeah. that, how about we move into the main topic this evening that has uh, nothing to do with uh, random UFOs or floaty balloons. Uh, we're going to be talking about NVIS tonight. So I get to geek out on ham radio, which is one of my Good, favorite I things to do. I have so many questions. <laughs> do I have an episode for you? Yeah, hey, Aaron, the, 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 yeah. Hopefully this what's, one doesn't do it. What's NVIS? I'd oh, love to know. Oh, oh, look at you go. Uh, so NVIS, Near Vertical Instant Sky Wave. So even the term is nerdy as heck, but that's okay. I know all so, of those words. <laughs> I've never heard them together. Tell me more. Well, there you go. Yeah. So the, uh, the easy part about this is, or the easy uh, explanation of this is simply getting your frequency or your, uh, your transmission 
bounces off the ground. It go bounces straight up into the air, into the ionosphere, and then basically comes right back down at a slight angle. Um, it uses HF, so uh, it is uh, an amateur radio uh, licensed thing, so it's not something you're going to be doing without license. Um, yes, uh, we've talked about this before where people will say, oh, I'll just do it when, uh, when shit hits the fan. I don't need a license. The government's watching me if I'm licensed. You can you, you take that if you want to take that route, go for it. That's uh, you're not going to be able to test or, or know how they, to use your stuff. That, they say that from their reasons. smartphones. Yes, exactly. Which may or may not work in an emergency situation. This uh, this should, as long as you've got power in a radio, which you know you may or may not. But oh no, I, I meant more like the the constant spying of the government through our. Phones. Oh right, yes, I see what you mean. Yes, there are. Yeah, uh, yeah. you don't want to get your ham radio license. I don't want to be on a list, and yet you've got a cell phone and a driver's license and a health yep. card, and yeah. So and the government TikTok knows what and you're Instagram right. and yeah. Facebook yeah. and yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the tickety talk yeah. is sending the uh, the balloons in the air. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, with this mode, this mode's really, really actually works quite well. It's a pretty common question with radio communications, especially in the preparedness world, where people say, I want to be able to talk to a family member, but they're the next town over or they're a couple of towns over. Uh, they're not within eyesight anymore. I can't get, uh, you know, like a two meter, or 70 centimeter antenna up high enough to be within that, uh, that sight line to communicate with them. I want to be able to talk to them though. If, if something happens, uh, this mode is probably the mode for you. Uh, again, what it does, like I said, it bounces the signal straight up the ionosphere and straight back down. Uh, same kind of idea for, uh, for your HF communication, which allows worldwide communication, except with the worldwide, it bounces up, it comes back down on a much larger angle and then obviously transmits worldwide. So this, this will do your, your closer range stuff. Um, so for example, I've run tests, uh, like I mentioned in, uh, what we've done lately for preps, I did a test with Scott uh, not long ago and, uh, distance between two of us is about 200 kilometers and we were able to communicate without issue. If, uh, if we were to set our antennas up for regular HF, um, use, chances are we would not hear each other. Uh, so setting up your antennas is actually quite easy. That's the other nice part about this setup is it doesn't have to be difficult to do. It doesn't have to be, you know, 30, 40, 50 feet up in the air in order to get to your antenna set up. It's literally 10 feet off the ground. Easy, simple to do. Uh, wire antenna as well. You can get other fancier setups if you want. You can go all kinds of crazy setup if you want. My experience with this has simply been a wire antenna, either an NFED, which is literally a wire in a box, and then the wire extends from that box as far out as you need. Uh, depending on the band that you're uh, you're operating on, or you can do a dipole, which is fed feed the uh, antenna in the center, and then you've got your wire shooting off one way and the opposite in the other direction. Uh, again, ten feet off the ground, nice and easy to set up. It can be incredibly portable. Again, my setup with the NFED antenna, I use that when I go out to parks and do parks on the air activations. It literally like just winds up, and I can carry it in the truck very easily. Uh, and it takes, uh, it takes nothing to deploy. So you, you do your 10 feet in the air. Uh, you can do, you know, there's going to be arguments about what the precise um, height is. Some say 10, some say 15, some say 13. It, it's going to be a little bit of testing on your part. I found that 10 works quite well. And uh, you're able to get that communication out. Uh, so is it is it 10 from like end to end, 10 feet at the one end, 10 feet at the other end? Yep. Or can you go up and down a little bit at each end? Or I you try want to, to keep it, it as, as vertical as possible? Yeah, I keep mine at uh, 10 feet and I keep it as, as horizontal to the ground as I possibly can. Uh, if you're off a little bit, it's not going to be the end of the world. Uh, but uh, like I said, I keep mine at 10. This is where it kind of gets fun, where you're going to have to test a little bit to figure out exactly what works in your setup. Uh, like I said, for me, I've had really good luck with 10. Uh, other people do 15, some do five. So you're going to have to kind of play around with that. And there's mathematical calculations uh, that you can search out on the internet as well to find that'll calculate out exactly how high you need it to be in order, depending on the frequency that you're using. Uh, but I found, uh, I transmit on, I found that 40 meters and 20 meters work best. And I found that doing the, the 10 feet off the ground seems to work uh, quite, quite well. Um, so in my testing, like I said, I've uh, been able to get a hold of Scott without issue. Uh, nice, clear signal. We could understand each other. 
Uh, we could talk, no problem. That was right here from the house. Uh, that was a little bit of a different setup, and I'll let uh, Scott kind of chime in about his setup. Uh, that With that test, I was actually using my antenna here that I have permanently set up in the backyard, and it's about 30 feet up. So it still worked, and uh, we could get a hold of Scott, no problem. So that's where kind of testing stuff out helps. Uh, I'm sure if I drop mine down to the 10-foot level, I would probably hear him a lot clearer than uh, than I was. But it still did work without issue, which was kind of neat to see because I haven't tested it before at that kind of height. So it was uh, it was a neat little experiment to see that I could still hear him. He could still hear me, even though my uh, my antenna was uh, up at the 30 feet. And that's my uh, my off center fed dipole that was uh, that's up that high. And I hadn't used it before for NVIS, but it uh, it worked quite well. So I was, I was quite pleased with that. Uh, but I don't know, Scott, if you want to talk about your setup when uh, when we're doing the test. So uh, I'm just going to dial it back and compare NV NVIS to a normal setup. Mm -hmm. So that normal setup, <clears throat> it's going out at more of an angle. Yep. You picture the cartoon with the little radio tower and the radio waves bouncing around the globe, and you sort of get that M shape you're drawing. And you end up with sort of this, this dead zone semi-close to you where you broadcast out it bounces off the ionosphere and comes down a thousand kilometers away so if you're in that 200 to 800 kilometer range you're not hearing it because all the radio waves are above you there um, so by changing the way the antenna is set up so that it's more of that vertical instead of sort of being a long m wave going up and down it's sort of a much tighter like it looks like it's a higher frequency just because the angle's tighter so all of a sudden you're able to hear things a whole lot closer to you. Um, and it's, I mean, this is the exact reason I got into ham radio as a, a prepper is the ability to talk one town over or to, you know, sort of for things I need. It's, it's great if I can hear Australia and pick up the BBC uh, shortwave broadcasts. But if there's something I'm interested in, it's because, you know, practically I need to talk to Eric because I know he has some supplies that, or advice or whatever. Um, that's if Jeff hasn't stolen them yet. <laughs> that is true. But at least then I'll know Eric had it and now it's at Jeff's house. This is um, true. <laughs> so what I had set up was a very long and fed antenna. It's about 120 feet. I've got sort of lots of yard. Uh, my height was very precisely set at about whatever the, tree limb that I threw a rope over <laughs> and hung it from. <laughs> That's uh, incredibly precise. Yes. Uh, there's a little bit of a slope to my yard. Uh, so, you know, I'm just picking a tree at the far end, pulling a lot of tension on it. But even with a lot of tension, my um, sort of the 18 gauge wire that my long antenna is, is going to have a dip in it. It's just not possible to have it tight enough to, you know, you look at power lines, they have to have that dip in them. Um, and I, didn't have any problems. Um, when we start talking about the London test, um, I stayed on the air listening to that for uh, you know probably a good hour before the band started fading. And it was just wonderful listening to people checking in from all different locations uh, around Ontario, a couple from the States, um, but just sort of fascinating being able to hear um, – here these so you know like there's someone in uh you know in the town where my folks are i'm like oh perfect that's good to know yep um so looking at it very much from that uh aries amateur radio emergency service yep. perspective you know this is a communication system that we can set up and use effectively that's independent of most other infrastructure right yep. sort of i if you have, especially if you have a little portable setup, you know, Eric's Pelican box going to the park, um, you know, that's all you need at each end to talk, which is the exact kind of technology that I love. So I think it's, this is such a perfect uh, prepper application of this technology. Yeah, and even to mention that I, uh, I didn't get into really the, the requirements equipment wise um, that you need to do this. And, and like you said, Scott, it's fairly basic. You need a radio that's capable of transmitting on HF frequency. You need some sort of power source for that radio. Um, so whether it be plugged into uh, a, a power source in your house that's plugged into the wall, or you can run these on batteries most of the time as well. Uh, obviously a microphone, 
to uh, the talk on and an antenna and then some coax to connect the radio to the antenna. So it, uh, it can be as fancy and as intricate as you want or as mobile and com- compact as you want. It's, uh, it's really nice that way. And like I said, it's as simple as just throwing the, uh, a wire 10 feet in the air. Uh, you also made a good point there, Scott, about trying to get the wire as tight as you could to keep it straight. That's not a big deal with uh, with doing the, the dipole uh, or end fed antennas. There can be a sag to it. It's not going to cause any huge, huge problems. Uh, of course, you're, you're, if you really want to check your setup and, and do like an SWR test and all that, um, finicking around with the antenna is going to make a little bit of a difference, but having a bit of a sag in it, it's not going to be a big deal, uh, especially when you're getting into things, you know, like a, a couple hundred meter long uh, wire antennas, they're going to sag. It's uh, it's just, you're, you're never going to hold them fully straight out and it's not going to hurt anything to have them sag. If anything, it's going to take a little bit of the, um, the pull off of them. So they're not going to get all stretched out. So it's, uh, I, I did spend some time when I first got into this trying to get things perfectly straight and it doesn't need to get to that level. So no problem with a little sag in it. And it's like we said, it's as simple as just a radio, a power source and an antenna. And you can do this as well. And that'll allow you to do worldwide communication if you get the antenna way up in the air. But uh, doing the NVIS is really, really simple. Um, See Patrick in the uh, the live chat's got a good question. Uh, does it matter if the antenna, so either end fed or dipole, is right next to your house? Uh, my normal eighty meter uh, sky loop is about twenty feet up, so above my bungalow, but the NVIS would be below the height of the building. Uh, yeah, I keep mine tucked right in by the house when uh, when I did some tests. We did some tests on this too in the summer with uh, with Kevin from Spark, and uh, he's in uh, he's in Alliston, so he's about eighty kilometers away from me. And we were tucked right in by the house and no problems at all. We were able to, to communicate with him as well. So it's, um, it shouldn't be an issue. Uh, you're obviously going to want to keep that antenna away from metal objects, that sort of thing that can uh, throw it off or, or radiate the, um, the RF as well. But um, having it tucked in, you're going to be 10 feet, right? So of course you're going to be below, uh, below the roof line. Um, so it should be no problem at all to have it uh, in close by the house. Just keep it away from metal stuff so it doesn't... Uh, doesn't interfere with it. Any possibility of doing this in a mobile setup? Oh, absolutely. That, yeah. 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 I don't see so, why not. So what yeah. I need to like pull over and stop my car and then transmit or what did just. So that's the fun part. You would be exempt under the highway traffic act in Ontario as a ham radio operator to operate your radio while you are operating your vehicle. Um, would I suggest doing that? No. Because <laughs> you're going to be paying a heck of a lot more attention to your radio than you are to what's going on on the road. No, uh, I, I meant in terms of I meant but, in terms of tra- like actual transmission yeah. legalities aside. Well, yep. Yeah. Um, Just had to get that still... disclaimer in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to. A lot of the time when I go and do parks on the air, we're in the truck if it's uh, adverse weather and still transmitting. Um, as far as antennas go, I haven't tested it with. Uh, any kind of a like a permanent installed like vertical antenna in uh, in a vehicle. I've only ever done it with wire antennas. So I'll take my end fed and stick it in the snowbank in the wintertime uh, or just in the ground if uh, if there's no snow and ice. So I don't know about uh, about vertical antennas like permanent installs on vehicles. If you're going to go HF that way, uh, you certainly can do it. Uh, you, like you can install an HF radio in a vehicle. It's low at that point, so I don't see why it wouldn't work. Uh, but you're not going to be installing a big wire antenna in a vehicle. So you don't, right, uh, that one, I'm not quite sure. We, you know what? We're going to have to test that. I was just about to say, I was like, tune in next week yeah. for those weeks. Now I have I'm an excuse to I've go got, buy another antenna. I've got a, like, I've got my, my TYT in my truck that I got from Rapid Survival. And yeah. um, it, so that should be able, does, it, should, it can transmit on the, on the HF bands, right? Uh, no, that does two meter and 70 centimeter. It doesn't do HF. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you're not uh, you're not doing HF on that, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, now I have a reason it, to go buy a, an HF antenna for the truck and test this out. But it'll it'll transmit on ten meter, right? I guess that's still not high enough. No, I don't think it does ten meter. I'd have to double check. I've only ever used no, that. I, I happen to be on their website right now. It oh, says good. ten meter, six meter, two meter, and seventy centimeter. Ah, so well, there you go. Interesting. So I could do it off ten meter because that would. Yeah, you could uh, yeah. Yeah. Could. Would it almost so? So this would be a dumb question then, or actually maybe not a dumb question, considering that uh, you have a pickup truck. Eric, would you be able to uh, run it the the eight foot length of the bed 
um, across, then would that maybe work? Like the wire antenna? Yeah. Possibly. I don't think it's long enough. It would have to be a bit longer for uh, for either oh, okay. 20 or 40. Um, but again, it just has to be a harmonic of, uh, of the, the frequency you want to transmit on, right? So I have to measure the bed and do some calculations on that. But that's the fun part with all this is kind of testing stuff out to see if it uh, if it'll work or if it will antenna or not. That's always the question: Will it antenna? So, I think we're so testing some stuff out. So, one of the big reasons. Yeah, go ahead. So, is one of the big reasons about testing this like is there anything that you need to keep track of um, certain heights or whatever? For, so, Eric and Scott, you guys were chit chatting. You know, you guys tested this. Like, is there anything that you need to keep? Um, consistent to keep that good communication like let's say eric puts his antenna you know two feet higher you know does it go outside of that like is that what you guys are testing or just to make sure that it works like is there you know like specific things that you guys are testing because it's like if you put your antenna too high too low you know because yeah. you're bouncing it back at an angle right would that angle go surpass that area that you're trying to reach is, is that a big reason for testing yeah, that and just we wanted to prove we could do it because, um, like Scott said, okay. that was kind of his big reason to getting in the ham radio in the first place was the more local-ish yeah. communication versus uh, line of sight communications. So we wanted to prove that it could actually be done, and then we wanted yeah. to just play around and see how far we could get and who we could talk to. That's why we hopped into the uh, the net that the uh, London Club did there on the fifth. Uh, but yeah, playing around with the heights could certainly, if you hit a certain point, and we should probably test this one day and just kind of increment up uh, the antenna until we get to a point where we can't hear each other anymore, and then we would know. Uh, we wanted something. Yep. We wanted to just establish that okay, if we're both at this setup, can we talk to each other? Yep. And now we know yep. that we can. So if something were to happen and we want to talk to each other now, we know that if I set mine up this way, Scott sets his up this way we should in theory be able to communicate. Now you get into the whole fun game of propagation and sunspots yeah. and all that kind of fun stuff that yeah. on some given day right. might prevent you from communicating, even if you have the most perfect setup in the world, ready to go for NVIS. Uh, but we know on that day, yeah. at least it worked. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a lot of testing and a lot of playing around with, with certain variables, which uh, is fun at times and frustrating at others. And it was very interesting listening to the London test yeah. over the course of a couple of hours because the band that they were working on started fading. Mm -hmm. So initially they were having really clear communications on you know the exact frequency they were working on. But later on it was dropping off and they weren't able to pick each other up. So we had changed frequencies to try a different part of the spectrum. Um, and it's really interesting when you, you read about NV NVIS and – you're kind of trying to thread the needle a little bit where if your frequency is too high, it's going to shoot straight through the ionosphere or just out into space. So it has to be low enough that it's going to bounce off. <laughs> but if it's too low, then it bounces off the lower parts of the atmosphere and doesn't get anywhere. So having the exact perfect setup today doesn't necessarily make it the perfect setup for tomorrow because there's, there's factors that – you can't see, smell, or taste that are changing in the background. So, yeah, whether it's it's understanding the art art of the science and being able to fin you know finesse it a little bit, and like because we're trying and we're just texting back and forth on our phones, and Eric's like, okay, let's go to this frequency, see if it's any better. And I'm like, oh wow, perfect, it worked. Yep. Um, so yep. the whole point of testing when we have phones is to be yeah. able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Why not you know, take so advantage that, of that convenience while we can, right? Yeah. You know, so it's a whole lot easier to run this test where we can text back and forth and just control variables rather than yeah. just be wandering around a little waterfall spectrum analyzer trying to guess like, oh, I wonder if that little spike is someone I want to talk to. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, if, if there's a specific, you know, collapse, event that you know you need to bust out all your preps or whatever the last thing you want to do is start you know worrying about all this stuff if you've got you know 15 different things you can try on your normal setup and you sit down and calm down and okay try this frequency at this frequency you know probably better than like trying to start this from fresh when you know you've already got the whole stress of no power you know no food mm -hmm. nothing at the stores nothing start you know 
but yeah yeah no i was yeah it's just got me very intrigued like the whole ham radio things i've got so many questions that i don't understand <laughs> it and i'm like because i have questions it's like i should probably do the course like just because but yeah it's, all, it's all almost, right now, almost what the yeah. course is designed for <laughs> Weird. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry how that goes. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know. I don't hey, know. Uh, I probably have more questions after it. <laughs> Eric and, but, and Scott, what are you guys using for your HF uh, rig, for your radio? I go first, Scott. Uh, so I have a Yesu, Yesu FT991A. So it actually does all three bands, which was what, what I found attractive. Um, I have that set up on my dining room table and a 50 foot, um, uh, coax, like 50 ohm coax out to like 120 some odd foot, like probably a full 40 meter wavelength, uh, and fed wire antenna that basically I just strung, strung a rope up at one end to anchor it and walk through the snow a big trucker's hitch uh, on the rope on the other end to put a bit of tension on it. And, uh, yeah, I thought it worked really quite nicely. Like, I was really, really pleased with how uh, how it ran. Cool. Yeah, for myself, so the, the test that I, when, when me and Scott were doing our, our tests there, I was running uh, my base station here, actually, where I run the, uh, the podcast from, sitting right here in front of me. It's a Kenwood TS590, so it's a 100-watt rig. Uh, then that's pumped through a uh, off-center fed dipole. It's a 270 foot long dipole, so it does uh, all the bands. That's why I got it. I got the room to uh, to put it out, so I did. Uh, and I was running 100 watts when we were doing that. Uh, and it's about 30 feet up. So that was kind of part of my test with uh, Scott. I was kind of curious if this antenna would do it as well. And um, obviously it did, because it worked out quite well. Um, in other tests, uh, that we did in the summer, I was using my off center fed dipole. So it's about a hundred and hundred ish feet, roughly give or take maybe a bit less. Um, and it's, uh, it was 10 feet off the ground. So, uh, both have worked, uh, quite well. And, uh, we were operating on, uh, 40 meters for, uh, for our test there. Um, and then for, uh, for the test in the summer, when I was talking to Kevin, who's, who has said it's about 80 kilometers away, uh, we were running one of my, uh, little Zygu radios. It was the 5100, uh, sorry, the 5105. And it, uh, it's a little uh, QRP rig, so it's a low power rig, uh, but I did have it hooked up to an amplifier. So we were pushing about a hundred watts with it as well. But that was with, uh, with the NFET antenna just hung up in a tree at about 10 feet and then run, run horizontally. So that was, it would spot. also be, it would also be really interesting to set up sort of as an experiment. If I'm set up with my antenna here, tennis feet off the ground, a little bit of sag to it, not terribly precise. And I am broadcasting very vertically, whether you're going to be able to hear that from your much higher antenna, but if you broadcast, it's going out at an angle, skip zone over me, and I wouldn't be able to hear you. Like it'd be you know, again, some of the yeah. finesse of antennaing. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the fun part with antennaing is you can model it all day long. It really depends on the day and what what it decides to do. Uh, but yeah, for us, I wasn't really sure if it was going to work or not with mine being about thirty feet up and yours being ten. But it worked. Uh, it worked quite well. Um, who knows? If we were to try it today, it might not. It might have just been a uh, an ionosphere thing that it was just playing nice for us that day, but. That's where testing comes in, right? To see kind of how things go and how well it works. Uh, and what do you use for your uh, your mobile um, or your portable HF rig? That's yeah, so portable. Down a bit of a rabbit hole of, yeah. <laughs> of HF radios now. No, it's all good. Thanks, My guys. portable setup uh, usually turns into. Uh, I've got a couple of Zygu radios that I run, so I've got the fifty one hundred five. Uh, the 6100, and then going to be testing out the G90 here shortly. I got uh, some restock of those coming, so I'm going to play around with that. But uh, they are little portable radios. They're not overly big, and uh, they're all um, self-contained. So they've got a battery pack in them. They have an antenna tuner. Uh, I can literally just take them and plop them down wherever and throw a little antenna on them, and they are good to go. Uh, the 5100, actually, yeah, the 6100 and the 5100 both without any th anything added to them uh, are just five watt little rigs uh, surprisingly five watts will do a lot for you 
So uh, everybody kind of thinks, off oh, five watts, you won't get anything. I have made some pretty decent contacts out of just five watts. Uh, the 6100, you can add a little battery, uh, external battery to it. It'll jump up to 10. And then the G90 on battery starts at 20 watts, and that's where it hangs out. Um, so they're uh, they're nice little rigs. And I like them. They're they're portable and, and easy to kind of get around. So that's my uh, my setup for portable. And then I use the Enfen antenna just because I've got it set up for portable. I've got it set on a spike, and it's literally just take an arborist bag, throw it over a tree limb, pull the rope over the tree limb with the other end of the antenna, and you're on the air within a couple of minutes. So it's uh, it's a nice little setup. Uh, we've got a cool. question in the live chat here from Patrick in regards to a normal dipole's directional front and back uh, with a dipole set up at 10 feet in an NVIS setup. Does it remain directional or mostly just straight up? So my understanding is at that point when you're at the 10 feet, it's straight up. It literally tries to bounce the signal right off the ground and right straight up. You're, of course, going to get some that still goes off on the direction. You're never going to stop that. Uh, but the idea is to bounce it right off the ground and then just bounce it right back down on that tight um, uh, pattern like Scott was talking about earlier to get the uh, the signal closer into people and, and avoid that skip zone. And let's see. And then uh, Rio, we've got another question. Does bending the antenna affect it? I was thinking possibly installing a ladder rack on my truck and outlining it with an end fed antenna. Uh, also, how would... Uh, being that close to a vehicle affect the signal? A <laughs> loaded question. So, Does it antenna? Uh, <laughs> does it antenna? Uh, my answer to that right off the hop is try it. See what happens. There are so many different things that can affect your antenna on, uh, on a vehicle. Uh, first off, nope. using the uh, ladder rack, if, it's, if that's going to be metal, you're going to have a heck of a time with that antenna. Uh, you just turn the ladder rack into an antenna. Yeah, you just turn it into it. Yeah, so it's that's going to be tricky. Um, running uh, mag mount antennas on my truck for uh, for HF operations when I'm at the parks. Yeah, sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't play nicely. You get into bonding and grounding and all those fun things that hams like to fight about uh, <laughs> when you when you start talking about doing antennas on vehicles. So um, my best answer to you, Rio, is is try it. You're going to find out if your vehicle antennas or just your antenna antennas or everything antennas. And you're going to know real quick if uh, if your truck antennas or your vehicle antennas, because all kinds of other things will also be going click and clack and turning on and off and you don't expect them to. So, uh, yeah, try it and see what happens. Can't hurt. I'd be curious to know if you do try it too, what happens with it and if it does work out for you. But that's uh, that's half the fun with this is kind of testing things out to see what they do and what they don't do and if it maybe it does do what you want or not. What advice do you have for people, Eric, in terms of you you want to test your setup and it's going to be a whole lot easier to do when other hams are on the air. So in terms yep. of looking at local ham clubs, looking at uh, national events, certain days of the week when more people are out doing parks on the air, that sort of thing. What, what advice do you have for people? Because it's great that you have this setup, but you can't really test yeah. your sort of bent truck antenna if other people aren't on the air to, to answer back. Great question. So you can just start yelling into the ether and hope that somebody comes back to you. They may or may not. You never know. Uh, nothing more f more frustrating than sitting for an hour in front of a radio calling CQ, which is, you know, I want to talk to somebody. And hearing nothing, because now you start asking yourself, is anybody hearing me? Is my radio working right? Am I actually putting a signal out? Did I set things up properly? Uh, we're actually talking, uh, myself and Kevin from a uh, local prepper group here are looking at setting up a uh, an HF net where we uh, set a certain date and time for people and say, okay, at this date and time, we're going to be on the following frequency. Let's try to uh, to make contact. And we want to kind of start it out with a local thing, so NVIS. And then if uh, if that takes off, we might spread it out a little bit differently and do like an NVIS one and do a, a more, uh, more distance one. But uh, we're looking at doing NVIS. So if this is something that interests you and you want to test it out uh, before we get that off the ground, uh, by all means, shoot me a message on the Discord, flip me an email. I know Scott would probably be willing to hop into. Uh, let us know. We'll just set up for you one day and we'll make it happen. Is there's uh, no better way to test than knowing that somebody else is going to be on the other end. 
because it's uh, like I said, it's it's pretty frustrating just yelling into the ether, hoping that somebody is going to come back to you. But don't be afraid to ask, and we'll like I said, we'll find a day. We'll we'll all set up. I'll find whoever I can to to help test out, and we'll just uh, we'll dial it in and we'll figure it out. Because well, we've got wonderful things like the internet and cell phones and easy ways to, to communicate with each other. We may as well take advantage of it because if it's not working, it's a quick text message or phone call to say, "Hey, try this. Hey, try that." And then try it again on the rig yeah. and see what happens. Yeah, and I mean, uh, at the same time, right? You're gonna want to test that. Yeah. I mean, going back to all those times where people were online compared to if those don't <clears throat> coincide with your schedule, yep. trying to make that happen to see if it works, and then you know when a scenario happens where everybody is depending on the system, everybody is going to be sitting by their ham radio. Yep. In comparison to, you know, at work, you work nights compared to other people or just, you know, whatever those scenarios are where, you know, people may not be actually on. But doing that is, uh, yeah, I mean, but when that time comes, you just know everybody's going to have that turned on somewhere and be listening and, you know, so, yeah. Yep. And Darius has a good point in the live chat as well. Uh, Radio Amateurs of Canada has a Discord channel as well. Uh, so you can post in there. People will certainly jump on. Um, Ham Radio Crash Course also has a, a pretty active, actually a very active Discord channel. Um, and there's people on there 24-7 that are willing to, to jump in and help you out as well. Uh, we're hoping to get Josh back on the show here to nerd out about Ham Radio as well in, uh, in the future here. We're looking at doing a, a series on communications. So uh, don't be afraid to hop into those various uh, areas as well. Just ask for help. Um, no, uh, no harm in saying, hey, I'm trying to figure this out. I want to learn how to do it. Uh, and like I said, the, the panelists here are willing to, to help people out as well. More than happy to set up one day and, and do a test with you and see if you can hear us because why not try to sort it out while times are good? Uh, touching back on the uh, the London test because that was kind of uh, the nice uh, eye-opening uh, test because I really haven't been able to um, see NVIS in that wide of a, uh, a usage scenario before. Like I said, I've done some tests with Scott. I've done some tests with Kevin. Uh, but the uh, the London test was, like Scott was saying, just fantastic to sit and listen after I had done my check-in uh, with net control. Just sit back and say, okay, where am I hearing? Who am I hearing? Uh, the furthest station that I heard while I was listening in was from Sault Ste. Marie, and that's about 570 kilometers away from my location. Um, so that's not as the crow flies that's driving, but um, that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good distance considering it's a wire in my backyard and uh, and an and a NHF rig sitting here in my uh, my office. So quite uh, quite impressive. It um, so the way that the London test was set up, the net controller is sitting at their radio. They you know sort of introduce themselves over the frequency, let people know what's going on, and then. Uh, call QRZ and everyone goes blah, 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 and calls their call <laughs> signs. That is called a pile up. Yep. <laughs> and that's an excellent description. Yep. And uh, that, you know, whatever, you know, there's a little bit that the host, uh, the host can pick out like uh, someone had a call sign ending in Zulu <laughs> and then everyone else shuts up and, you know, Oh yeah, this is V three Zulu, Zulu, Zulu. Yep. Uh, and they report their location, yep. sort of their uh, their signal strength, and that sort of thing. And it goes back and forth for a minute or two. And then, you know, the, the host says, thank you, and says, cures you again, and there's another pile up. And, <laughs> and they just, you know, sort of pick out whatever call sign they could make out from the pile up. <laughs> but it was really fun listening to, because I know where I am. Everyone else is reporting where they are. And you're just kind of filling this mental map of all these different areas that yep. that you're talking to, and it's fantastic. When I'm like, okay, I, you know, that one's probably a hundred kilometers from me. That's kind of cool. Oh, that was, you know, that one's like I said, my parents' hometown. Awesome. Um, you know, and it just kind of carried on for a while like that. Uh, you know, and everyone eventually gets to introduce themselves, gets uh, ticked off. And I believe the London Amateur Radio Club was going to do a report and sort of list all of these contacts. Um, and it, it, it's fascinating because you're listening to the two of them talking and like, oh, you know, I'm not hearing you so great. But some of the uh, some of the other people checking in, 
like I swear they could have been sitting in the room with me. It was so loud, clear. It was just beautiful. So it's um, anyway, it was just wonderfully educational in terms of my thoughts and applications that, yeah, if there's a disaster, I want to be able to talk to the you know, one in two towns over. I, I don't need to talk to Australia. Unless they're sending a balloon our way. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to get that in there. <laughs> but yeah, it, it yeah. is a, uh, a neat, uh, a neat mode of communication. It's not something that um, is very widely used um, right now, at least that, uh, that I've seen. Uh, even like the London Club was mentioning in, in all their advertisements, it's something that uh, isn't widely used currently. They wanted to do a test to kind of see uh, how it can work and how it can be put to use. Uh, it was awesome to hear, like uh, Scott was explaining, the, the pileups there, uh, just the number of people that were hopping in to, uh, to check in with that control. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind, just because I'm hearing a station in Sault Ste. Marie doesn't mean they can hear me. So that would be kind of part of our test that we're trying to uh, to figure out with doing a, a little uh, prepper net is we would be able to check in with that Sault Ste. Marie station, say, okay, you can hear me. Now, Sault Ste. Marie station, I want you to call Scott. And then Scott, you call the Sault Ste. Marie station. Okay, now you call Jeff. Jeff, you call the Sault Ste. Marie station. And then we can verify that everybody can hear each other and talk to each other. So we'll both send and receive. So that's kind of what we want to do with... Uh, with this, uh, this prepper net idea is who can you talk to, who can talk to you and kind of establish distances that we can get and just get like a, a standard set time that we all hop on and just chat because why not get you using your radio, gets you familiar with it, gets you familiar with setting up your antenna. If something doesn't work right that day, we can work all together and try to get it fixed for you. So get you some troubleshooting experience as well. And it just gets us all talking because uh, right now we're just some talking heads and, you know, on a podcast or on YouTube that you're listening to. So if we can kind of chat uh, on the radio back and forth and kind of help each other get the, their comms up and going, uh, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, and it'll be a lot of fun, too. And I guess if you can't get to the specific town you're talking about, but you can piggyback yep. to someone and then they can reach that town, right? Relay you can it. Use a, yep. a, yeah, use a relay, use a middle person to get all the info it'd yep. be nice to know before yeah it'd be everything. really yeah, good no, to know yeah and then we can yeah. set up communication uh, standards too right like on this day we're going to be using and actually london amateur club did this as well where they said okay here's our primary frequency our secondary and then our third frequency so if you don't hear us on the first go to the second you don't hear us on the second go to the third and it actually worked out well because the first there was a I think there was some kind of contest or contact that was going on there. The second, same thing was already being used. We ended up actually using the third frequency at first um, just because the bands are busy. So it's kind of nice to have that kind of plan in, in, uh, in setup as well. So we know that uh, okay. if I don't hear you on one, I'll go to two. I don't hear you on two, I'll go to three. Um, if you want to see a good setup as well for doing communications on radio, uh, Tech Prepper on YouTube, fantastic setup. He does a lot of... Uh, ham radio operations out in the field and he has a whole comms uh, system set up where they will transmit for x amount of time on one frequency then they'll drop down uh, x number of kilohertz they'll transmit there for a certain amount of time then they'll go down again and he tries to make contact with a, a certain station uh, he calls it no random contact series it's a uh, it's a good series to kind of keep an eye on and watch as well because he'll uh, nice. he's got a whole comm plan set up and it's uh, kind of good to have in the back of your mind or even deploy yourself if you're going to do this uh, for an emergency situation. So it's, um, yeah, it's neat to see. Uh, any other NVIS questions, comments, or anything like that? Panelists or uh, live viewers? I just find it kind of useless. I mean, we all have cell phones. I don't see why you want to do that. Cool. Thanks for coming out, Pierre. It's, it's been fun knowing you. No, no, but uh, I mean... You know, it, it's kind of cool. Like if, uh, I mean, you know, Scott had mentioned that this was a big thing for him. So like if he's testing it out and realizing he can't get to, you know, set set of friends, family, whatever in town, but he can communicate with someone that can relay the info, you know, most people that probably do the ham thing are mostly all preppers, but just being like, hey, write this frequency down. You know, this worked for us. Um, let's say a scenario happens, you know, we'll do check-ins at you know, at nine o'clock in the morning and three o'clock in the afternoon. Yep. And then, you know, if that person is due to, you know, just it's, it, it, it is pretty cool. It is, uh, it is on my 
to-do list in the last little bit. And like the more you guys are talking about it, I'm like, man, I kind of got to do this, but I'm like, <laughs> ah, I got to do it. But there's just so much. And, yeah. Yeah. No, so it, it is, it is just cool. It, it's kind of cool to hear how all this works without actually getting into the course. Yep. So great question from Patrick in regards to does time of the day or band make a big difference? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> Uh, so when we were doing our test back in the summer, Jeff was here and we were trying to make contact with, uh, Kevin and Alliston. Uh, there was one day it wasn't happening. We could hear stations in the U S we could hear stations all over the place. We were not hearing Kevin at all. He was not hearing us. It just wasn't going to happen. Um, uh, at least the beer was cold. That was good. <laughs> uh, a couple of days later, we tried it. Boom, crystal clear. We could hear him, no issue at all. Uh, turns out there was a bit of a solar storm the first day we were trying, and it was just killing our killing our transmission. He just he wasn't hearing us. Uh, I tried to check in with some other stations as well. We just weren't going anywhere. It, so yeah, weather for sure. Time of day also will uh, will affect you. Uh, like twenty meters at night, you're just not gonna. It's not gonna happen. You're gonna want to do forty meters at that point. 40 meters throughout the day and night, most likely you're going to be all right. You might want to try 20 meters during the day. You'll probably have a little bit better success that way. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. Time of day, band make a huge difference. And that's kind of part of your testing uh, too, to kind of get a feel for what's going to work well for you at certain times of the day. Uh, it's uh, That's the joy of HF. You're you're kind of at the mercy of Mother Nature and, uh, and the sun. So sometimes they like you, sometimes they hate you. It's... Um, it just, it all depends on how your, uh, your RF, um, it's your radio frequency when I say RF, uh, how it goes and how it bounces off the ionosphere. So it's, um, that's another thing to keep in mind too. In, a, in an emergency situation, you might have to try for a day or two. If, uh, if mother nature and the sun's just not playing nice for you, that's where your plan gets into place, right? So I'm going to be on this frequency for X amount of time, then this one, then this one, then I'm going to stop for a half hour, an hour, then I'm going to do this, this, and this, having that in in place and having people you're trying to talk to know that that's what you're going to do kind of increases your chance of making that contact, but don't get frustrated if it doesn't happen the first time around. Chances are it won't. Uh, we just, we really lucked out uh, myself and Scott with it working pretty much right off the hop. Uh, but I have had it where it's failed and we haven't been able to make contact for, uh, for an entire day and we have to try again. I, um, I mean, going back to your point, Pierre earlier, Years ago, I'd bought just a, a used sat phone uh, at auction, sort of looking at getting into comms. And it's just not a practical solution. I mean, it's sort of dependent on so many other things and you know, subscriptions and, and whatnot. Yeah. So this is just such a nice, ideal, you know, I need my gear here. Eric needs his gear there. We need a little bit of luck. But, you know, we're not dependent on yep. something, you know, some equipment outside of our control <laughs> other than the ionosphere. <laughs> yep. Yeah. No, no, I mean, yeah, no, it's it's kind of cool. Like, now I'm intrigued where I'm like, I want to get this rig and then see if I can communicate with you guys. But, like, yeah, no, it's, it's yeah, you, another rabbit hole I can go down on my own time, I guess. Uh, so, uh Melissa in the uh, live chat there's got a good question as well. Is there anything you can buy to help you break through that bad weather? A Amplifiers. Really good cell phone. <laughs> a cell phone, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, TikTok. Yeah, uh, TikTok, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there you go. Uh, weather yeah, balloons? No. Um, yeah, no, no, yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, yeah. So an amplifier will help you with that. It's not going to be the be all save all. Uh, it can kind of help get your signal a little bit more, but if it's not bouncing off the ionosphere and it's just going right out in the space, you're not, you're just talking to whoever sending the, uh, the weather balloons, I suppose at that point. Um, so yeah, a lot of it is really just dependent on where that signal is going and if it's bouncing back down nicely or not. Um, if, uh, if, if they're just not hearing you, but like the ionospheric um, setup is is good and your signal is bouncing the way it should be, uh, an amplifier will help boost your uh, your signal up or at least your, your audio up so they can hear you. Uh, but it's, uh, it's again, the kind of a, I hate giving the uh, maybe answers, but a lot of the stuff with ham radio is it might work, might not. It, uh, it all really depends on uh, on your setup of the day and Mother Nature playing nicely with you. 
Any other questions from the panel or the live chat? We've had some really good ones tonight. All right. Nothing I will ask while this is recording or live. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, like I said, we want to do a little series on communication. So uh, this is was kind of the, the start because uh, we just have played around with NVIS. Seems to be a popular thing right now. So we want to kind of talk about it a little bit. Uh, we will probably cycle back to it again. If uh, anybody is interested in testing out, if you're already licensed and you want to test out uh, an NVIS system, please do reach out on Discord, flip an email into a feedback at prepperpodcast.ca. I will gladly either find somebody to test with you if I'm not around at the time or uh, put you in contact with, uh, with somebody that can help you out. Or if I am around, I will just set my system up and we'll uh, do our best to make it happen. I'm always happy to nerd out and play radio anytime. So if you give me an excuse, I'm even happier. So uh, I did put the uh, the link in the live chat here to the Discord. So if you want to hop in there, it's probably the easiest way. There is a, uh, a channel off on the left side there specifically for ham radio. So if you throw a message in there, you will most likely get somebody that's willing to jump on and help you out. And I'll be posting information in there as well about uh, doing our prepper net that we want to try to get set up and, and actually running. So pay attention in there and I uh, will mention it as well in future podcasts. But like I said, we're going to be trying to talk a little bit more about ham radio and communication in the, uh, the upcoming episodes. So uh, stay tuned for that. But with that, shall we uh, move into the podcast challenge? So take what you've considered, read about some ham radio ideas like NVIS and see if there's something that you want to learn more about that would be an appropriate addition to your preps. We all love learning things. These are neat things to learn about. Are they something that you think would be useful? Awesome. All right. Uh, upcoming events. Uh, the annual prepper meet is uh, happening again this year in uh, Desborough, Ontario. I will have to double check on the dates and such, but uh, I have seen posts saying that it is uh, it is happening. So uh, we'll get that information to you as soon as uh, we've got it available. Uh, we've got a weather blurb from Jeff. So between the time that I wrote this weather blurb, which was Saturday morning, and now things have changed a little bit, but not shocking. I'll, um, but I'll give you the information I've got anyway. So we're looking at the potential for a severe weather outbreak uh, on Thursday the 16th. Uh, it is still several days away. I'm just making everybody aware. Uh, this could be a long range, um, well, not long range, but long effect storm uh, that Basically, the, the low pressure system will be somewhere in the northern U.S., southern Michigan, Ohio, and the tail of it is going to uh, go down from Ohio, down the whole uh, Ohio River Valley, Mississippi River Valley, down into the deep south, you into Alabama and, and that kind of stuff. Um, I'll keep an eye on it. I'll uh, do the updates on the Discord. There is a section there for general weather. I usually... Uh, Keep things up there as soon as the forecast becomes a bit more clearer. Um, things aren't looking quite as bad now as they were then, but there's still the potential for for that to change. We're, we're four days away. So, um, you know, considering that uh, Southern Ontario is expecting double-digit temperatures Wednesday, Thursday. Remember, we're in the middle of February, and we're talking uh, 12, 13, 14 degree temperatures in Southern Ontario. So... Uh, high dew points, so all of the ingredients are there for some sort of a severe weather system to form. So just keep that in mind if you're uh, anywhere in that area, and um, we'll go from there. Again, like I said, I'll I'll post uh, updates on uh, the Discord when I've got when I can tie it down a little bit uh, more firm. All right. Uh, for the uh, annual preppers meet, just uh, double checked. So the official dates are July the 6th to the 9th. And again, that's uh, Desborough, Ontario. So once uh, once they end up uh, with uh, making tickets available and such, we will let everybody know. All right, we got a deal of the week. So around the world, there's approximately 900 weather balloons launched twice a day. Buy in bulk, you can get a great deal on used weather balloons right now. 
<laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Terrible <laughs> advice, but funny too. <laughs> All right. Or you got yourself some rope so you can set up your NVIS antenna. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Do both. Just go all go. go all out. You know, attach your NVIS antenna to your weather balloon. See how high you can go and still make contact. Perfect. I was yeah. I was actually just thinking about that. Like, if I had like a small helium tank and a big heavy balloon, could I string my antenna up literally anywhere and just get on the air? I guess your uh, yeah, your only limit there is the length of your coax. Yeah. Yep. A lot of loss if you're going up 30, 40 feet or 30, 40,000 feet. <laughs> but, uh, I say test. Maybe it. you can communicate with the pilot mm-hmm. at that point. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Just long enough to say stop, don't shoot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we come in peace. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we got some shout outs, I see. Uh, I want to shout out you, Eric. Thank you for helping me. Tune in my NVIS setup. Uh, it's incredibly cool. I think yeah. it's such a such a great thing, and I very much appreciate the help. Yeah, no problem. I want to shout out my mag buddy who was helping me with vacuum sealer, and uh, sort of some of the new friends that I made this week. So I think it's been a great week for shout outs. Nice, awesome. Well, with uh, email and iTunes reviews, it was uh, beyond getting a couple of spam my uh, emails about us having voicemail and such, which is not a thing. You got to get a little bit sharper with the emails. If you're going to trick us into clicking links, uh, <laughs> nothing. I listen, so, I listen to the, I listen to the episode. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I know better. <laughs> Do you know who you're emailing? Come on. <laughs> we need to get a little bit better than that one. Uh, with yeah. that, I'll bring episode number 195 of the Canadian Prepper podcast to an end. You can find the podcast on iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, of course, your favorite podcast app. Uh, Please help us out. Submit a review. It does help other people find us. And we do record these shows live on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, Go back a few episodes. You can hear me live uh, express my displeasure with how we, uh, how we do record. Uh, If you want an early peek at the show, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, Canadian Prepper Podcast. Click the notifications tab. It gives you an alert when we're going live. Uh, You can contact me at Alan, that's with one L, at prepperpodcast.ca. Please don't send me any voicemail. I will not open it. I'm just impressed that StreamYard specifically made a change because of your rage quit. I'm an influencer. It's fantastic. <laughs> they now locally record things and then stream it afterwards. <laughs> and if anybody wants to reach me, you can uh, send a message to feedback at pepperpodcast.ca or I am frequently on the Discord. Uh, feedback at pepperpodcast.ca also works for Scott or maybe I'll be on the HF bands. We'll see. There you go. Um, off the wall customizing on most socialist media's platforms. Um, <clears throat> I'm not on the Discord often, but if you need to, you can probably find me there, or you can find me on Monday nights on YouTube's for the other CPP as well as their platform that they use. That whatever, but uh, yeah, where I get more in depth on my critiques of the government. All right, you can check out uh, Rapid Survival at rapidsurvival.com. Get me there on the live chat. Uh, you can also reach me at feedback at prepperpodcast.ca or potentially NVIS on 40 meters. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Until next time, uh, be prepared, stay safe. And keep learning. <laughs> <laughs>